Hi, I'm Doug Clements from the University of Denver. And along with my wife, Julie Sarama, we've been working for a long time on learning trajectories in math for all young children. And especially, we've got better learning trajectories for children with disabilities because of our work in the STEMI project. So let's take an investigation of what it means to have these various uh, learning trajectories. We know a lot about how children think and learn about math. And we know a lot about teaching all children. And in fact, we know a lot because we know how to teach with learning trajectories. I was lucky enough to be on the National Research Council report on mathematics in early childhood. And the subtitle of that report is Learning Paths Towards Excellence and Equity, both excellent learning and teaching and equitable learning and teaching. So what is a learning trajectory, right? It's got three parts. There's a goal in mathematics we want the kids to reach. There's a developmental progression of levels of thinking that all, most all kids follow on their way to reaching that goal. And then there are teaching practices, the environment every day, and intentional activities as well. Fine-tuned for each level of the developmental progression, that help kids level up and get to the next level. In other words, a learning trajectory is kind of metaphorically like a garden path. If we want to get to that gate and get into the garden, there are steps to take to get to that gate, the natural way children get to that, that gate, right? And then the teaching activities are just ways to support kids as they go from each step to the next. So learning trajectories are asset-based. That is, developmental progressions help us know what kids know and can do. We're always building on what they already know and can do. We don't treat kids like blank slates that we're going to fill with mathematics. Instead, we help them build on the many intuitions and ideas and practices that they already have. And then the teaching practices and activities build up on those helping them level up until they reach the goal. This is mathematics their way, mathematics natural to children. So, to make this a little more concrete, we thought we'd look at learning trajectories for composing geometric shapes, both two-dimensional or flat shapes and three-dimensional. All right, let's explore a little bit. Pick uh, some of these pieces to put on there to fill in the puzzle. Yeah, right. Okay, take that one and put it where you think it goes. I hope you can see the puzzle she's working okay, what with. What else would you like to choose? Can you do some more? In the lower right is a picture of her previous take, attempt. I'm just making a few notes here. You go ahead and take whatever pieces you'd like to fill in the puzzle. Okay, and if you can see the puzzle she's trying to work on, she is not even matching the shapes to their outline in the puzzle at all. And you know, one part of us could think, she just, what am I supposed to build on? She's not even, she puts a square on a triangular foot there of that puzzle, that animal in the puzzle. But think about it. What can we build on? Well, she knows she's supposed to put down the shape. She's supposed, she's supposed to fill the puzzle. She, and, and beyond that, even though she's not matching the shapes accurately like we would do, if we were doing the puzzle, but she puts the same shape on one foot as she put on the other foot. Ah, she's got an intuitive recognition of the symmetry of that puzzle and is using that. That's a pretty sophisticated idea for a just turned three year old to have. We can build on that. Okay, let's go up two levels from this level, which we call the separate shapes actor. It's a foundational level. Two levels up. And before I start the video, I want to explain, because this goes pretty fast. 
If you look at the lower right here, she's going to try to put an orange square in where you and I can see only one of those blue diamonds or rhombuses or like two tree, uh, green triangles would fit. The square's not going to fit there. But she's at a level where she can do the puzzle, but it's all by trial and error. She doesn't see angles the way you and I might, right? So let's take a look at what she does. She tries to put the square down, and when she does, it pushes the other two shapes out of the arm. So what she does is fix those and try holding them down and push the square from there. That doesn't quite work. So she gives up. Lucky for her, right next to her hand is a blue rhombus, and she puts that in, and it works. Trial and error, but she actually finishes the whole puzzle. The good news is most early childhood educators are really good at watching kids' processes. So you see that she she's, she's way leveled up from that first girl, but she's got some places to grow, even for a preschooler. So let's see a preschooler who's yet two more levels up, kind of our goal level for preschool, right? Uh, this one we call the picture maker, and the next one we call shape composer. So here we go. Watch the difference that this girl shows you compared to the first two. First of all, she's going to take a shape and then immediately recognizing the robot symmetry, she's going to put the symmetric shape on the other side. And she does that again and again. Confidently, she grabs the shape she knows and she turns it and puts it there. Now watch this. One thing you can see is that she really thinks about it. She sees the puzzles, she sees the shapes. But the other thing is this. Watch her eyes. Ready? When she picks up a shape, then where does she look? at the puzzle people she doesn't need to watch the shape when she looks at the puzzle she's got the ability to build maintain and manipulate the image of the shape in her hand mentally and she by the time her hand gets it to the puzzle it's already in the right orientation and the right position she's built mental images of this that's the shape composer level, very powerful, right? So remember, there's three components to a learning trajectory. The goal is to get about where this girl is at shape composer level for preschoolers or kindergartners even. The developmental progression, we saw three levels that kids are increasingly knowledgeable and sophisticated in what they know and can do with these shapes and composing them, putting them together to make other shapes. And the third thing is instruction. So think about this for instruction. It starts really early. I switched to, to um, uh, 3D shapes, but all shapes are actually 3D. These are just a little thicker. Um, but notice that even a baby starts putting things together in interesting ways. If you look at these three here to make a shape that's kind of like these, they do it intuitively. So this kind of play, absolute play with the right materials is one wonderful foundational level. My first teaching job was in kindergarten. And when I started that job, I got pattern blocks, which were what those kids were using in the videos, but also pictured here in color. And I got these puzzles. Now, this is the sheet that's given to me as a teacher. The kids get those puzzles on larger pieces of paper, of course, right? But look at the level of this. Where would you put this? For which of those three kids would you put this? Every one of them has all the lines drawn inside those shapes. Every one of them would kind of help that first girl get better at matching the shapes within the lines. Do kids really have to compose shapes, especially mentally, to though do these puzzles? No, they're just matching shapes. I didn't realize when I was a brand new kindergarten teacher that I had kids at a lot of levels, but 
the instructional materials I was handing out only helped kids at one levels. So you got to watch for that commercial activities, right? So what we do is we we do free play with these shapes. Of course, I always have kids play with the manipulatives first, and then we'll do small groups where they're just doing puzzles, having fun doing the puzzles. I'll show the video for just a few seconds here. How did it start? Start it by the right shape. They're all doing puzzles. But you know what? The teacher has given each of them a puzzle that's the level above where she's seen them already successful. So if any of you know the Vygotskyan idea of zone of proximal development, that's the learning trajectories approach. Know where the kids are. And then some of those kids might be with very simple puzzles. Some might have more sophisticated puzzles, but they're all playing together, right? So let's take a look at the different levels for different uh, levels of thinking that the kids might show. That first girl in the first video might get levels, uh, 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 a puzzle like this, where again, she can get better and better at just matching the shapes given the outline of every single shape. Then the second girl might get a puzzle like this though first, where if you put the triangle down in the nose of this bird kind of uh, puzzle here, you can see that the yellow hexagon here is going to fit. This takes some work. You've got to figure out how you're going to put this uh, the shapes within there to fill that body, but it's not incredibly hard. For the third girl, we want to give her some challenges. Putting those tan rhombi here, pretty challenging. Looking at this angle versus this angle versus this angle and making sure you've got a shape with the right angle in this larger amorphous kind of body of, of this puzzle is challenging for her, the third girl there, right? We do the same thing online, by the way. Kids, Hexagon. kids benefit specifically from Rhombus. working online. Rhombus. Because they can duplicate shapes. If you want to remove all the shapes, click this button to clean them away. They Hexagon. also might have to rotate a shape. Rhombus. Not that Rhombus. Oh, wrong pick. Put that one back. How about we duplicate this one but then we're going to have to turn it and this is key did you see she has to pick which tool she's going to Rhombus. use next so that's essential because we have found that if you work online and with physical materials the physical materials are really important for your body for embodied cognition but the computer does have some special advantages. For example, we've noticed that when kids work with manipulatives and paper puzzles, like you saw in the pictures, you know, they just turn and flip and slide shapes around, no problem, but they don't think of what they're doing. If they're on computer, they say, oh, I need to do the turn tool. I need to do the flip tool. Ah, explicit awareness emerges on what's called geometric motions. So once again, let's go through the levels. First girl might get one like this. Do you notice they only touch at the vertices? Really helps her match those shapes. Then she'd get one like this where all the outline of the puzzles that's there to help her match. But when they, when they don't just touch at the vertices or corners, they match side to side. The second girl will get one like this where you really have to start composing and the third girl's going to get one like this. So she really has to think about that. And always people, always time for play. So there might be a puzzle, a puzzle on computer where there's a, you know, there's multiple right ways to fill those with different shapes for sure. But you get feedback that, oh, whoops, you left a space or whoops, you have one outside the puzzle. But we also just let kids play. They create a scene. They pick a background. They just make what they want to make, but using 
the mathematics tools they learned. And I love this. It was by a three-year-old, right? So, okay, it's not a real sophisticated picture, but I adore that it's cute. And look at what she did over here. I never thought of that. She gave a balloon to one of the children in the audience. So wonderful. Intentional activities and play. And I show you this video for one reason only. I love what the girl on the left says, kind of towards the end of her her little uh, uh, filling the puzzle. Listen up. Yeah. Most people don't know what trapezoids are. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Good for you. Our kids know more about geometry than most of their parents. Um, and incidentally, a good idea for these kind of things is to send home information that helps parents with those kind of things, what we're doing, what they're learning and the like. Um, once again, the language you can develop as you interact and watch kids play with these puzzles is incredible. I love what she does right here. What I, I, what I can do without all the lunch. Without a hexagon? Yeah. Yeah. That's neat that you figured that out. I figured it out. You guys are on fire. No, you're not. <laughs> I could do a heart. You think? Let's see. Now, this is going to be interesting. I've not seen this one put together yet. I saw it on the computer. It's a dove. A dove? Oh. Uh oh, what do you need? A rhombus. A rhombus, she says, you know? So just so much language and interest, uh, her showing the interest, helping them extend their vocabulary by making sure they have the, the words for what they're doing and everything, priceless. Hey, and everybody, it's not just mathematics. It's more than just mathematics. Here we see that if you do, now this was actually first grade, not preschool, but Implementing tangram puzzles, I've been showing you pattern block puzzles, but we also do tangram puzzles, uh, enhances the creativity of young children. And that creativity was measured verbally as well as graphically, you know, artistic wise, picture wise. So it's really important to do these things for executive function, for vocabulary development, for learning to learn, and for creativity. So Let's switch for a minute. We were doing flat shapes. 3D shape compositions actually is typical for kids early. And I want you to think about why do we do a learning trajectory at all? You know, let kids play. Yes, we should let them play. But we can also be intentional about the way they interact with them, both in intentional small group activities and in free play, right? open exploratory play and solving semi-structured and well-structured problems with intentional teaching increases the complexity of what kids make in free play and teaches them. If you base it on learning trajectories, you get two or three for the price of one. So block building is foundational for achievement in mathematics. Boy, it's amazing. The sophistication of kids' free play block building when they're preschoolers predicts their math scores at grade seven. It predicts all the high school assessments they take. The, it predicts number of, of mathematics courses they take, the number of honors courses they take, the number of advanced math courses they take. People, nothing could be more important than giving kids that kind of thing. So that's the goal. What's the developmental progression for 3D shape compositions? Well, at first, the foundations, kids just play blocks randomly or individually, right? At about a year, they learn to stack. Now, they might put that block down and it slides off and they learn from that, but they don't stack yet. Then at about a year and a half of age, they make lines, good. And then soon thereafter, they stack, but they look that they are 
uh, stacking the same block, right? Like this. Then they are piece assemblers. They make purposely a wall or a kind of um, uh, 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 tower there that has a pattern actually in it, doesn't it? Then the picture maker puts, starts putting these together in a way that's different to make uh, other things. And then shape composers start making arches and ramps and buildings. And then eventually, you know, by the time, and these, these ages are completely average. You'll have a three-year-old who's at this level and you'll have a six-year-old who's at an early level. These are just averages. But then they start combining composed things like arches and, and stairs and the like, right? Okay, so instructional activities, again, they differ. They start when the kids are very young. Yes. Uh oh. Yay, Woohoo! An older child. Uh, this child has incredibly limited language. Um, didn't start talking um, uh, till. Till very recently. Nice. Look at that tall tower. There's of a parent. Mama. 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 More, more. I see a blue arch by the red cup. Relational language, spatial language, colors, and shape. Okay. All just in a conversation. Uh oh. Should we do it again? And listen yeah, arch, for another arch. math concept that comes Purple out. Purple arch. Two. 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 She just started saying words at all. And she, two, right? So in general, when you're exploring like that, you facilitate the explanation. You give verbal and nonverbal help. She, the, the parent might have actually helped her steady that building, but the child... Good, fine motor control did it herself. Verbal supports in kids' home language and had lots of uh, emphasis on spatial thinking, the stacking and the like. We have a website for STEMI called Learning and Teaching with Learning Trajectories. It's at learningtrajectories.org. Just one compound word, learning trajectories. Dot org, in which you can see these levels and you can see how it looks when kids are at various levels. And you can read about inclusive teaching approaches for kids for that topic specifically. So those are really helpful. The activities themselves include composing 3D shapes during routines and transitions or intentional activities like let's stack, uh, stack blocks. And there's all kinds of helping teachers prepare the environment for access, adopting materials, teaching, and, and the like in the environment for better access, all built in to learningtrajectories.org. So block building, why LTs? Because you allow kids to just open up both in their free play as well as their interactions with you and with other kids, open up their capabilities for understanding mathematics and spatial ideas. If you follow those, and by which I mean watch the children first, playing with pattern blocks for the 2D, with blocks and any block set for the 3D, how are they using the, the blocks, how are they putting them together or not? Then you can know, okay, so if they're stacking, but they're not making like an arch, maybe I can introduce that kind of thing and give them uh, uh, some uh, motivations uh, to increase the complexity of what they're doing. And they love it. Is it important? Absolutely, people. Do you know the architect Frank Lloyd Wright? So he went to a kindergarten that was a Freudian kindergarten, 
And in that kindergarten, the intentional activities included getting a picture. They would get this picture and they would be given the blocks and they were supposed to reproduce that picture with the blocks, right? That's what Froebel called his sixth gift, okay? The strikingly wonderful thing is to compare that that Froebel did when he was in kindergarten for two years to his Robbie house. Look at people. It's, it's incredible to think that what he did when he was five or six, because back with, in Froebel's time in 1877, kindergarten wasn't one grade. It was a whole range of, of uh, years that kids would be there. You can't but see the comparison between the play and the intentional learning he did and his eventual fame uh, and production as an architect. Solving problems with intentional teaching is a powerful combination and learning trajectories are the perfect tool to help you do that. So I hope you see we've made we have a lot of contributions we've done through research and development working with hundreds of teachers, thousands by now. We have practice-based evidence that this is scalable and really helps kids learn and makes teaching and learning more joyful for everyone. It, we have guidelines to help you incorporate asset-based instruction grounded in the knowledge of kids thinking and learning, learning trajectories, keeping kids engaged, active, inventive, and talking, and content that's always challenging, but always achievable. So there's the address at the bottom of that website. And now I think we'll have time for some live question and answers.